Welcome to the Heart of Hospitality podcast hosted by Duncan O'Rourke, CEO Accor Northern Europe. Hospitality matters because it has heart. In this series, we'll be speaking to our guests to celebrate the moments and lives that make this sector so special and to spotlight the true heart of hospitality, people. In the third episode of the season, Duncan speaks to Kate Nichols, CEO of UK Hospitality. They discuss UK Hospitality's role championing the hospitality sector and lobbying the government for positive action and change. Kate's passion for education, opportunity and development, and why it's important to offer hands-on lived experience to Generation Z to nurture the seed of passion at an early age. Right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm very, very happy to be joined today by Kate Nichols, CEO of UK Hospitality, representing the UK hospitality sector. Kate and her team advocate and lobby for over 740 companies operating around over 100,000 venues across the UK, including accommodation, food and beverage, events and attractions, leisure sectors. Kate, an absolute honor, a pleasure to speak with you today. In essence, you are the voice of the UK hospitality sector. Talk to me a little bit about what really this means, what you do and how you would work with the industry markets and governments. Well, thank you for having me here today. It's a real pleasure to be able to join you. I mean, our role as the Trade Association and and my role in particular is to be the the voice, the champion, the defender, the shield for the industry in the UK. And we work across all four parts of the UK. And we're also the UK representative in Europe. So uh, our sister organization, HOTREC, which is the European Trade Association, we are the UK voice there to make sure that at a European level, we also have a strong representation. But our role is, is primarily, it, it's, it's threefold, essentially. I'm there to promote the reputation of the sector as a great place to grow, work and invest. So I'm, I'm the sort of champion and flag waver to say how important we are economically, socially and culturally. Um, I'm there to to really try and get the best regulatory environment that we can in which to do business. So prevent the imposition of the unnecessary costs of doing legislation, promote the sort of positive areas that we need to see change. So really campaigning on behalf of the industry. And over the last two years, that's primarily been around COVID. Can we get the tax cuts? Can we get the financial support? How do we keep and maximize the jobs that we've got in the sector? And how do we allow people to grow and and build those businesses back up? And then um, partly because it's such a a sector of uh, small and medium sized businesses, there's a sort of protect element. So promote, prevent, protect. That's about helping people to to comply with legislation, giving them advice and guidance, but also giving them insight. So we've got a lot of SMEs within uh, the, the sector. How do we give them the consumer insight, the market intelligence, the horizon scanning to help them be better at growing their business and evolving their business as we go forward? So quite a complex set of issues that we do, but most of it is forward facing, being that champion. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Kate, uh, uh, everybody knows, I mean, in the industry, yeah, we know how much work uh, you and your team are doing and, and, and everybody's very grateful. More personally, what is your background and what brought you to the sector and what what kept you in it for so many years? Well, I think like so many people in the sector, I'd never thought about a career in hospitality and I kind of fell into it and then you fall in. It's such a fantastic place to work. There's so much camaraderie and it's such a collaborative industry. I don't think people who, who haven't worked in other sectors realise how different it is if you work in retail, if you work in supermarkets or if you work in, in uh, other parts of the, the city businesses don't collaborate. We are hugely supportive and collaborative and cooperative as a sector. And I think that's what got us through COVID. We we kind of came together to be able to support each other through it and have nobody yeah. left behind. So my personal background is political. So I started working in the European Parliament and the House of Commons, uh, working on campaigns, working on uh, research projects um, in the European Parliament, looking at doing all the reports on, on environment, consumer affairs, food. I got lobbied by a lot of the UK hospitals hospitality businesses, Whitbread at the time in particular, the brewers, the food restaurateurs, the hoteliers, um, and was recruited by Whitbread to join them to be their government relations person within the company to to advise the board 
that's how I fell into hospitality. So I find myself sort of 23 uh, working with the, the major hotel brands that, that Whitbread had at the time. They were a brewer. They had pubs. They had restaurants. They had Marriott hotels. They were just developing Premier Inn. We were just buying Costa. Um, so I was advising the boards of all of those companies um, and just found hospitality just such a fantastic and interesting place to work in. Then moved into to agency, but always, always worked on the hospitality side, advising hospitality businesses. And so when the trade association job came up to be the face and the voice of the sector, first of all, I, I was uh, the head of the pub, bar and restaurant trade association from about 2014. And then when we merged to, with the British Hospitality Association, brought hotels and contract catering together with pubs, bars and restaurants, which I think is unique in all the sister organizations we've got across the board, the, uh, the world, that we've got that breadth of representation. I was the first CEO of UK Hospitality 2018. So it's always been politics and, and hospitality. That's fantastic. And, and you are a female CEO. Is that something you consider or is that, uh, are you just a CEO? Uh, I always like to think of myself as just a CEO because you, you've got to right. cut it and yeah. it's always got to be meritocratic. And our sector is very meritocratic. However, I am conscious of using my position as a female CEO, particularly in what is two quite male dominated industries, um, politics and hospitality, to Correct. be a role model. I, I do believe fundamentally you can't you can't be what you can't see. So I take it quite seriously when I am out there as the voice. Um, I also take it really seriously when, when I'm asked to be a spokesperson. So to go on news items, to, to do things like question time that I've been asked to do, that you need female voices on there. Uh, and you can't turn it down and you ought to be there as a female representative. Um, I also wanted to make sure that we had a, uh, diversity and inclusivity as one of our key issues that we promoted and worked on when I right. took over in 2018. Um, again, on that basis of you, you can't be what you can't see. Um, we set up Plan B mentoring, which was uh, uh, to, to try and increase the number of female executives within the industry because we, we didn't have as many at the time. Mm -hmm. Really pleased that we've now got a third of all um, CFO, CEO, CMO, and, and chair uh, 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 positions are now female. We now need to work on the other bits of diversity and inclusivity. Um, and the other motto that I've always had, somebody gave it to me when I started at Whitbread, was lift as you climb. So let's make sure that as we go further up, we don't pull up the ladder behind us. We leave those and we increase the number of areas for people to come and, and climb up behind us and make it easier. Oh, fantastic. And the sector, you know, the, the, as you know, the sector is very broad, which you work in. And of course, there's significant differences between pub, hotel sector. But the one thing that unites them all is that human touch. Service, experience, emotion, that's all wrapped together on both the guests and the staff. So how do these differences and similarities impact your work at UK Hospitality? Well, I, I actually think that there's a lot more that we have in common across the whole of the breadth of the sector than, than comes that there's a point of difference. Um, you know, fundamentally, we're a people business, as you say. Right, so right. people are at the heart of what we do and are going to drive a lot of the issues that we need to campaign on or work on. We're also property based. Um, all of us. So we've got issues to do with leases, financial management, business rates, high street regeneration, investment in the property. Um, but first and foremost, we're about experience and giving customers great experience and giving the communities in which we, we exist great experience. So actually, I spend a lot of my time talking to different subsectors and we have round tables of CEOs from various parts of the business they all talk to me about the same things. There might be slight nuances and they might be a different order of priority that they put them in, but they tend to have all of the same issues that they're really concerned about. There's more that unites us than divides us. And I think that's what's been so effective as we've gone through COVID is having that real clarity of purpose to say, tell me your top five, top 10 things that are keeping you awake at night. Right. And then working across the whole sector as a whole to to distill that down into the top three so that whenever anybody in the sector meets an MP, meets a minister, meets a, a journalist, we've all got the same common hymn sheet. We've got the same messages. We've got the same asks. And that makes it much more compelling when we're trying to get the support that we That's need. That's right. Yeah, no, no, indeed. And of course, lobbying is a big part of your work. What does that entail and what are the priority topics under discussion right now? Well, I always think hospitality and lobbying are really, really similar. 
lobbying is basically trying to get your message across to government and trying to give in a, a, a very digestible format, an, an overview of, of the operational insight, the issues that are affecting the business and putting forward your proposals for what you would like to see to change. But essentially, lobbying is about human relationships That's and it's right. about people. So it's about sitting down, understanding what it is the person in government or in the media or another stakeholder is looking for, working out the win-win and presenting back to them what what would be a good workable solution or a compromise these are natural hospitality skills it's why i always think hospitality is a great place to start in your career because they are transferable skills it's what we do day in day out that's what i do in my job just with politicians and other stakeholders it's about building relationships with them getting their trust talking to them about the issues of the day and and learning what the customer wants their customers like everybody else who's serving a customer. My customer is slightly different. Um, the language I use is slightly different. Right. But if, if you're a frontline hospitality worker, I do what you do. I work out what the person in front of me as my customer wants. And I try my very best to give them it in a way that they will go away feeling happy and pleased and thinking that they've got the right outcome for them. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. UK hospitality, like our core, is putting a lot of emphasis on the workforce, talent, staffing and skills. In fact, you, Kate, launched uh, the National Workforce Strategy, establishing short, mid and long term strategies to support and grow our sector. Tell us a little bit about this. What does the strategy look like and what are your priorities? Well, I think people is the number one priority that for everybody, whenever I meet any operator across any side of the business at the moment, what they tell me is they could do so much more, they could perform so much more effectively, they could be more profitable if only they had more staff. And that's, that's common right. across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's, there's, it's not unique to the UK and it's not unique to hospitality, but they are. that's what they all tell me. Um, and so when we looked at it coming out of COVID, I don't think anybody expected that the labour market would be as tight as quickly. We knew it was coming, but we didn't realise it was going to be this difficult this soon. Pre-COVID, we had a vacancy rate of about 4%. We've now got a vacancy rate of 10%. And half of our businesses are saying that they can't operate at full capacity or, or, or occupancy because they don't have sufficient staff. So that means we're leaving money on the table. Um, and that's not good for us as businesses, but it's also not good for the, the economy as a whole. And it's not good for UK PLC because if, if you don't have enough staff and you can't operate, you're not generating those taxes that we need to grow the economy and stave off recession, get us out of, of a the challenges that we're seeing with the cost of living. So that's why we put it top of our priority list. Um, and it was returning to things that we'd, we'd started work on before COVID. So the, the medium to longer term issues about how can we make sure that we're challenging the perceptions of the industry as a place to work? How can we go out and recruit and, and get good careers messages to children in schools, young people as they're coming out of full-time education, explain to them the benefits of a career in hospitality, which is some of the ones we've just touched on, you know, the soft skills you get, the career opportunities, the meritocracy, the fact that there's no other sector of the economy, which will allow you to have delegated authority at such a young age, such a low level within the company, and allow you to expand your horizons and grow to be a manager within less than two years. So, you know, the sky's the limit, but also no other sector of the economy gives you that camaraderie and fun while you're at work. So you can be a widget manufacturer or you can be an accountant in any sector of the economy, but it's only in hospitality that you're going to have fun working there. So first That's and right. foremost, it's yeah. about those perceptions mm -hmm. and promotion. But behind that, it's about making sure that the sector as a whole has an employer brand that we can all be proud of. Companies like Accor work really hard at it, but 70% of the sector in the UK is SME. And so they can't invest as much in, in uh, training. They don't necessarily know what common standards of training look like. They don't necessarily have the, the HR policies. So we're doing a lot of work in that space to make sure that we can stand up as an industry as a whole to say, here is the hoteliers charter. Here's the hospitality charter. This is our commitment to you. You come and join us at an entry level job with no experience. This is what we will do to invest in you. So it's developing common standards of training, entry level qualifications that we can all get behind, um, good quality 
uh, pay, remuneration, benefits packages, looking again collectively at the issues that we know have been a challenge, double shifts, split shifts, long hours. How do we address that yeah, going forward? Yeah. And how do we make it much more attractive as a career? And then behind that, it's looking at um, what can what can government do to get out of the way or to help us invest in productivity? So reform of the apprenticeship levy, to allow us to invest in more training, to boost productivity, boost management and leadership skills and digital skills. And then also looking again at immigration. Clearly in the UK, with 1.3 million vacancies in the economy and 3.7% unemployment, we don't have enough people in the country to be able That's to right. fill all the jobs we need. So we need to look again at making sure that that immigration regime is flexible so that companies like a core can move people around. You know, one of the benefits of hospitality is you can move around the globe. If we're making our markets so tight that you can't move or it's less attractive to move to the UK from Paris and then move to Milan, move down to Singapore. If, if we miss out London and the UK as part of that, our young people of the future will not get the good quality training and experience. We rely upon that movement of people across the globe to be able to bring the best experience and to train up the, the leaders of the future. No, no, absolutely. And we discussed that as well before we started here, how how challenging this this uh, um, this problem we have of attracting talent coming back in and into the and it's not it's not only UK and you have a you've been very transparent, but it's it's like you said, it's worldwide and uh, um, it's important that we're addressing it. And, and, and there are people like you and your team that are really helping in mind. Bearing in mind that your lobbying work with the government, what single thing would you ask from government to possibly impact UK hospitality workforce? On the, the workforce point, I, I think at the moment it is about giving us greater flexibility on that mm. apprenticeship levy. That's mm. a tax on jobs at the moment, and it's a tax on training. And we can't use it in the way that we know we need to really boost or upskill a lot of our workforce, take people through what's needed to be able to draw them into the industry and rapidly upskill them. We've got lots of our 18 to 24-year-olds joining the workforce for the first time who've never had a job. So before they can start on an apprenticeship, we need to be able to train them up and upskill them to make them as productive as they possibly can be. So on the workforce side, I would say that. Um, on the more general business side, we've got such huge inflationary cost pressures coming through again, not just in the UK, but across the global supply chain. Businesses, however much they are getting good revenue coming in, it's not translating through to, to profitability at the bottom line. Um, and businesses just don't have the headroom to be able to invest. So to tackle that perfect storm of uh, cost of doing business, cost of living squeeze with a hit on discretionary spend, the businesses facing the challenges in the middle and needing to invest in their, their workforce, I would say the biggest thing they could do is to cut VAT. You know, right. th that would yeah. help yeah. the business right. have the headroom. It would sustain and boost it. demand mm -hmm. um, and it would help our sector as a whole. Okay, what I mentioned before we started, I said, you know, with these COVID years, it became more and more uh, clear and transparent to me that the hospitality sector is grossly underrepresented in, 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 in the government level. Um, why do you think that is and, and what can we do specifically because the hospitality sector or industry contributes 10% of the global GDP, so one in 10 jobs. Um, and so that's why we so appreciate what you and your team are doing here in the UK. But why do you think that is? I think partly it's because we tend to talk or had talked prior to COVID about tourism. And I think tourism is sort of soft fluffy is something that we do in our leisure time and therefore you don't think of it as seriously as a, a sort of a big economic activity it's very obvious when you've got a car plant or a, a factory you can see vi visibly the 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 economic input that you're getting there and there's a big impact if there's job losses um, at one of those plants tourism and hospitality spread throughout the country large numbers of SMEs, as I say, and therefore the scale 
doesn't or hadn't become apparent. But I think COVID has changed that. We worked really hard um, when we merged and created UK Hospitality 2018, 2019. We worked really hard in, in getting the economic stats to show people how big and important the sector was. 130 billion revenue, bigger than aerospace, automotive and pharmaceuticals put together. 3.2 million people employed, so twice the size of financial services in the UK. Um, a, a, a 40 billion pound tax take, which was uh, the entire size of the defense budget or the social care budget. Those kind of messages really resonated with government. And, and we were talking about the, the potential that we had. So pre-COVID, we were going to grow 5% year on year for the next decade. We were going to generate one in six of net new jobs. And politicians were sitting up and mm. taking notice of that. Um, and I think that that stood us in good stead when COVID hit. COVID then gave us a very literal demonstration of what happens when you don't support hospitality and tourism, when you don't look at it sensibly, because literally the light and life turned off from our town and city centres. The, ec the economy went backwards and you could see that throughout the two years of COVID. Every time hospitality switched back on and started up again, the economy grew. Every time it wasn't there, the economy shrank and we right. hit recession. And I think government has recognized that. So I think it's still a work in progress, but we now have a tourism minister, a hospitality minister and a food minister. So three departments pushing on number 10 and number 11 to get what we need, lobbying and, and talking about the issues of concern that we've got. We have a tourism recovery strategy and we have a hospitality recovery strategy. I think what we then need to do is to, to build on that and leverage it and make sure we don't lose that positive contribution. Um, and the other thing that, that um, ministers now do seem to be aware of, the importance of selling Great Britain abroad of our tourism, heritage, culture, hospitality um, in attracting inward investment as well as attracting in international tourists and visitors. They, they see the importance uh, of that to the economy and they now recognize it as our third largest export earner. Yeah, no, that's that's good, and and we just we need this momentum to obviously carry on. Of yeah, course. We're, and, and I yeah. won't stop telling them. I just reel off all the stats, <laughs> and then I, I give it. everybody the same stats, and then I tell yeah. everybody whenever you meet anybody, media, politician, whoever you're talking to, just hit them with these five stats and just keep hitting them. So that's the way lobbying works. Yeah, correct. Uh, a friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, and former pod podcast guest MPS Puri said the hospitality industry is the most glamorous in the world and he talked about people in the hospitality being neighborhood markets the place where global leaders come to discuss life-changing decisions where celebrities come for work and play these are you know these are deeply aspirational assets are these industry outputs that you champion in your work as well Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, all of our hospitality businesses within the UK are at the heart of their communities. Um, we, and it's a different community and it's a different vibe that they've got depending on where they're located. But I think we in the UK don't value the service sector as much. And we, we just sort of take some of that element for granted that this is this is where real work happens. I think the government is starting to change that narrative and we push them really hard on that. You know, I was in a meeting with the levelling up secretary who talked about the importance of having really good pubs, bars, restaurants, hotels in order to get the film studios to invest in Watford because Tom mm -hmm. Cruise was not going to go and stay there if you only had a premiere in. Or at Redcar, where you, you've got a lot of inward investment going in in life sciences up in the northeast. Again, he was talking about the need to have those great places where those industry leaders can come together, the community can come together, and you, you attract that inward investment on the back of it. That's right. And I've spoken before on this podcast about the perception of the hospitality sector, especially okay, with the younger generation. And if you think about children, they are naturally inclined to role play hospitality, serve food, sell lemonades, pretend to cook and all that. They understand the sector and they gravitate towards it. Where do you think that goes? I think we we I think it's beaten out of them at school, um, not literally. Um, I, I think you know we tend to have a particular focus on an academic route through. Um, there's an aspiration and a target for fifty percent of the UK population to go to university. 
and schools are targeted, the state sector schools are targeted on how many of their pupils they get into university. That's not necessarily targeted on the basis of what's right, what's the right outcome for those children in that sector. So a school is graded according to university applications. It's very easy to make that university application. So we get them on a track from about 11, 12 onwards, right. looking at that. And, and it's very difficult to jump off that and move on to the vocational side. Um, and if you do, you're looking at it just purely from a food food basis and chefs. Now, they are an important part of what hospitality does, but it's not the only part of hospitality. So we need to make it easier and get better at communicating the breadth of roles and opportunities that people have. Um, and and uh, we're doing work with um, CareerScope and uh, Springboard, to be able to get that career information into schools at an early enough stage. And we've got a really good um, pilot project, which some of the Accor hotels in Manchester are participating in, where each of the hotels in central Manchester, 15 hotels, are partnering with a a large uh, academy school to be able to do careers information and education by getting the children into hotels. Now, it's not just those children who are wanting to work in hospitality or catering, but it's looking at finance, marketing, law, building, all of those kind of skill sets that you need to be involved in running a hotel, that's what they're looking at doing. And I think, again, it's that practical lived experience of seeing what it could be like, um, as well as selling that that aspiration. I mean, you, you talked about the aspirational Gen Zers, you know, When I did a careers talk at my daughter's school, um, they were amazed that at Central London Hotels, the thing that impressed them, they were wearing an Armani um, uniform to go to work when they were working in some of the top class hotels. (laughs) One of them was was saying that as a 16-year-old, he'd started at concierge as an apprenticeship, and he was driving around in the back of a Bentley to go and pick something up from, from Harrods for a client in the hotel. Now, I appreciate those are the exceptions, not necessarily the norm, but... That's the kind of tangible things that we can sell. You can travel the world. You can wear swanky uniforms. You can eat in the best restaurants because you're going to get that food while you are at work. And you earn really good salaries. These are people who can, from going at very little qualifications when they go in, within two years can be earning 50, 60,000 pounds. Um, and I, right. you know, I had another yeah. mom who was, I always say at my daughter's school, they want me to talk about my career, my background, my pathway through, great. But give me the same amount of time to talk about hospitality and the entry level to the children that aren't going to go to Cambridge um, with respect to the the school. But, you know, um, I had a mom say to me, she really wants to, she really loves um, MasterChef. She's thinking about being a pastry chef, but I can't see that it's worth her time. And I'm, you live in London, you go and train as a pastry chef, you are going to be in demand in London. That's 60,000 pounds. Absolutely. You know, why are you not giving her that encouragement to go and do it? Why is it better to go and do something something else? Um, Which they may not necessarily like even. Absolutely. If you've got that passion, let's not beat it out of them. Correct. Of course, education is a key part of that answer which you mentioned, both improving education on the sector of schools and universities, but also in the industry, the, the education in our sector, apprenticeships, as you mentioned, academic qualifications, mentorship. Do you think the sector needs a universal qualification? Maybe that that would help in encouraging and attracting. I think it, it would help. And, and I think that's an area that we want to look at next as we come out of COVID is to look at the, again, it's, it's back to your point about there's more that unites us than divides us. Actually, when you, you boil it down, the induction training, the entry level training that most of our, our bigger companies give has common elements. Now, how fantastic would it be if we could take those common elements, make them sort of freely available as a skills passport that young people could could get behind, could, could train themselves up in? Basic barista skills are now increasingly common, basic food safety, health and safety. We did a lot of that online training free and made it freely available during COVID. If we can capture that, turn it into a sort of universal standard of, of qualification, A, it helps the the SMEs in the sector who don't know where to go and don't know what to do. Um, They can have a buy-in. 
B, it means that we can guarantee that when you come and work in hospitality, you will have an investment made in you and you know what to expect. And C, we give those children and their parents who are skeptical about us a piece of paper that shows that they've got something that is a common transferable skill. Don't Correct. underestimate that stamp in the passport, the piece of Correct. paper that you Correct. can wave. So I, I, it's an area that we want to, to build on and, and work going forward pretty rapidly. Are you addressing that with the uh, education ministers in the in the British government? Yes, we are. We're talking to the the treasury. We're talking to the education ministers. We're talking to the business oh, department about how can we, if we did this as an industry, if we made that investment, first of all. How could we fund it? Can we use some of our apprenticeship levy to fund that development to get it up and running? Um, and secondly, will you endorse it, Minister? If we do this, will you get behind it and endorse it? Oh, wonderful. Pre-COVID, I, I recall very fondly your, your work explaining to the British government that the hospitality sector is not a low-skilled sector. Do you think they understood that? Uh, and if not, do you think that's part of why the political world seemingly fails to understand our challenges? Um, I... I, I, I... It's the biggest frustration I have when I talk to ministers. Yes, we do have a large number of people who will come into us at entry level. They are entry level jobs. You don't need experience. They are not low skilled jobs. It's the people we're talking about coming into those roles. Um, what frustrates me is that, that they fail to understand how rapidly people rise within that, how much training we invest so that they don't stay with no experience and no skills. They, they rapidly upskill. Um, what we did was that every time a member of the government or a politician stood up and talked about low skills, low skilled jobs, entry level jobs, we challenged them to come and do one. So we had an <laughs> MP skills challenge and we've had them coming into to hotels, pubs, bars, restaurants across the country. Great fun. Gives them a real insight into the workings of a hotel or, a, 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 you know, that most of them think that we run with about 10, 20 staff. They don't realize how big and, and scale they are. But we made them do um, bed making Olympics, uh, pizza cooking, uh, barista right. training, um, you know, pulling a pint, which is the easier one of, of all of those. You know, come, come and try it and tell me that any of those jobs are low skill. Um, and also, you know, it's, it's fine that they're entry level jobs, uh, but you need those jobs to make the economy move. You know, you can have a brain surgeon, but if you don't have the cleaner and the cook in the hospital to make sure the patients are clean, fed and well looked after, the hospital grinds to a halt. You can have your executive chef, but if you don't have a kitchen porter, the most important person in, in the kitchen, or you don't have your housekeepers in the hotels, the most important people that I would say are sort of front of house in hotels, the hotel can't operate, the restaurant can't operate, the pub can't operate. I, I can tell you I've got degrees coming out of my ears in Chaucer's dream poetry, but what you want first thing in the morning is somebody who can make you a cup of coffee as you get on That's the train. Right. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, and the City of London, I think, would grind to a halt if I was the person making coffee. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, th these are important jobs. And the MPs themselves, you know, in the House of Commons, they they wouldn't get very far if they didn't have the the catering staff who keep them fed, watered, looked after. So that there's a new appreciation, I think, coming through. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Do you, what do you, what do you think of the learnings between different countries? For instance, do you share with your counterparts uh, for lobbying in Europe or North America? For instance, are you communicating? Yes, we work really closely. I mean, at the European level, there is, is HOTREC, which is hotels, restaurants, catering, tourism, um, quite different markets uh, across Europe. Um, and at a UK level, we are more brand driven and larger company driven than, than you get across continental Europe, um, different in the States again. Um, it, with the States, you obviously have two or three different trade associations that do my job. Um, and I, I think the, that's the learning that I've got from across the globe. Right. We're the only one that joins everything together and brings everybody together. So most of my sister organizations say, how did you get the attention of government and, taught, and, and the, the focus and the support from government? Because they didn't get it in their countries in the same way. Um, and my answer would be because we join everybody together. So in, in the States, you've got the Hotel and Lodging Association. You've got the National Restaurant Association. They're all just looking at sort of individual subsectors, the same in Australia. Um, so we compare notes. We share best practice and guidance. Um, 
clients. We share lobbying asks during COVID, what worked for them, what didn't work, how can we use their experience to, to lobby the UK government. Um, but most of them look to us first and foremost uh, throughout the COVID crisis as how did we support our sector through it? How do we have so few business failures and job losses? That's right. And we come in out of the we come in out of this pandemic. And and one thing is very apparent with all these pandemics and crises that this industry has faced. It's such a resilient, such a resilient, optimistic sector. And and if we can resolve this global workforce issues, the you know, the 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 impact will be huge. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that's one of the other things. Resilience has often been used against us, I think. Um, and it's partly why governments take us for granted. I, I get told that we're quite a self-healing industry. Whatever mm. shocks we've gone through, we, we just evolve. And it's partly because we're entrepreneurial, we're dynamic, we're innovative. We've got a lot of SMEs that come up. They might fail, but we get more coming in their wake. Um, so governments do kind of take us for granted because of that resilience. But there is an appreciation for that skill set that that our business leaders were the most agile, the most responsive, could turn on a sixpence, worked on solutions. Government recognizes that in contrast to a lot of the other sectors of the economy. And those are standards and principles and uh, attributes that I think will stand us in good stead as we go forward into what will be uncertain times for quite a period to come. Yeah, correct. I mean, that's one of them. But what else do you think is so special about the hospitality industry? People. People. Exactly. It, it's it's people. You know, we we are we are different. We are we 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 care. It's our job to care. It's our job to make people's everyday lives. And we're a unique industry that we touch every single person's everyday lives, sometimes on a daily basis. Our job is to make people's difficult, challenging lives. We are the spot of brightness in their day that we pick them up. We give them a bit of a, a metaphorical hug, sometimes a literal hug, but we give them a brilliant experience and we bring people together like no other industry. And what would your advice be for someone at the start of their career in the hospitality or your advice to someone looking for a new job who maybe hasn't considered hospitality? Well, for the latter, if they haven't considered hospitality, where have they been? Why are they? <laughs> why have they not joined us? Come and join us; it's great. Um, for anybody within the sector, I would. Uh, my advice would be: reach out, talk to people. There, our sector is really accessible. Leaders in our sector will happily give of their time to support people. So, talk to your manager, talk to your colleagues, ask for support and help. There are mentoring schemes available. There are industry networks available through uh, organizations like the, the Institute of Hospitality, the British Institute of Innkeeping. People can come along and network and get peer-to-peer -peer support. But also, I've, I've never had anybody in hospitality say no to me when I've reached out and asked, can I ask for five minutes of your time to help me develop my career, work out where I need to go? That's what we do. We're, and, and we're a collaborative industry. Um, so people should exploit that, make the most of it. Sorry for all the managers listening who are now going to get bombarded by <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> Just a few five minutes. But it's true. It's it true. is true. It's absolutely true. Listen, Kate, I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I know you're extremely busy and, and uh, we really appreciate that, uh, especially on behalf of the the team we started, Heart of Hospitality. It's people like you that keep this uh, and your team that keep this industry uh, focused, resilient and drive. So I really, really appreciate it. What I normally do just before I end is I ask five very quick questions. Uh, you can answer uh, one word, two words, whatever you would like. Uh, a lot of people have fun with this. So okay. we're going to quickly go through that. If you had to have dinner with anyone in the world, who would you choose? Oh, alive or dead? Uh, doesn't matter. Up to you. Doesn't matter. I, I would want to have dinner with Shakespeare. Oh, lovely. What cuisine would you eat? Uh, Asian fusion. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Korean street food at the moment. I, I live oh, really? on Korean street food. But basically, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, a mixture of all of them. You can throw any of that at me and that would be my, my favorite cuisine. What is your favorite food to cook? Uh, Christmas dinner. Oh, really? Yeah. I love that as well. Yeah. The the whole works, um, the, the chutneys, the cranberries, the Christmas pudding. I know that's just an English thing, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I love it and I love all the tradition. 
What is your favorite pub or cafe in the world outside the UK? Outside the UK? Oh, the UK has the best pub, so you just have to discount <laughs> that. There, there is no, That's true. there is nowhere else that There's would no do. <laughs> I agree there, is no there is no um, substitute. <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever been given? Uh, lift as you climb. Super. Lift as you climb is is the best advice. You know, it's it's do unto others as you would want to have done unto yourself. And and, and I've always taken that. And when I first started at Whitbread, you know, it was, uh, and I follow it through in hospitality, the people you meet at the front line, you need to be as nice to them as the people you would want to be meeting at the end because you can never tell in hospitality when the CEO is going to be at the front door and you should never treat anybody differently. That's so right. um, I, I always take time to talk to the, the team members who are, are there looking after me because without them, I don't have a job. Absolutely. I'm very, very much aligned with that. Okay, listen, thanks very, very much. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to say, with pleasure, but I really, really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Well, thank you. I, I would just say, you know, thank you to all of the people uh, on the, on the, listening to this who have supported us throughout the, the whole of the time we've had with COVID. We couldn't do it without you because we need to have the businesses and the people in the industry behind what we do. But also it is just a huge pleasure and an honour to represent this sector in a public facing role and to be your voice and champion. Thank you. Super. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Heart of Hospitality was hosted by Duncan O'Rourke, CEO of Accor Northern Europe. To find out more about the people that make this sector so special, visit our website and find us on Facebook and Instagram. Instagram.